you want to be a cop Then you got to get in shape Gotta jump a six foot wall Gotta swim a giant lake Gotta run for 15 miles Die! Gotta make it through the maze Gotta be like Superman You gotta be strong and brave Shape it up, shape it up, shape it up What's up everyone? I am the Kaji no Kami from the Toku and Animation News Network and today I'm going to be taking a look at the 1987 Metal Hero series, Shojinki Matelder. Spielbahn marked the end of an era for the Metal Heroes franchise. After five years, Shozu Uehara stepped away from being the successor series' head writer. Toei hired Susumu Takaku to replace Uehara. Takaku had been a writer going back a decade to Spectre-Man, Inazuma on Go Ranger, and Jaka, and then became a co-writer with Uehara on Spider-Man. He also was the head writer for Go Lion, the show that would become Lion Voltron. Thus, it was quite fitting for him to replace Uehara here. The idea was to make a series akin to that of Kikaider, but with their own spin on it. Initially, the new series was going to be called New Machine Bikeroid, only to ultimately take up the title of Super Android Metalder. Unlike what had come before it, Takaku wanted to take Metalder into a more serious direction, having the show revolve around a plot that stemmed from World War II. Finally, if you are not aware, Metalder was the source material for Ryan Steele and the villains of VR Trooper's first season. Trooper, transform! Does Takaku have what it takes to make a show that is on equal footing with Uhara's content? Or did Toei make a big mistake when they put him in charge? Watch to find out. The Heroes Matilda is a story about a bunch of overworked, underappreciated employees. It's already bad enough that they have to deal with an overbearing slave driver of a boss, but then they also have to worry about being hunted and killed by Matelder. We've got a mutant who just wants to raise his son with his pregnant girlfriend in peace. <laughs> One who just wanted to play with his violin. Another who just wants to spend time with his newfound pets. A robot who wants to enjoy retirement. And then we have Metalder, who just comes in and murders them all in cold blood without a care in the world for their feelings. <laughs> it's oh wait a minute hold on yes okay thank you it seems like i was given the wrong script Metalder is a robot created during World War II by a scientist named Ryuchiro Koga, played by Mothran Etrigan star Ken Uhara.
Dr. Koga created Metalder to resemble his son, who died in the war. However, for some strange reasons, completion of Metalder was halted for 40 years until Koga felt it was time to finally activate him, giving him the identity of Ryusei Tsurugi. <laughs> Koga gives Ryosei the mission of having to stop an evil empire from conquering the world named Neros. He then, for some reason, heads out to be killed by Neros' minions just to teach Ryusei a lesson? <laughs> I think the doc was a few cookies short of a faux jar. Thankfully, Metalder is not alone in his fight as Dr. Koga left him with a robot companion called Springer. I know we've had a lot of ridiculous things by Toku standards in the past. We've had a hamster, we have had a dog in Denjimon, but here it just doesn't work. Jacka's Genpei Hayashiya brings in his talents as this talking dog. Springer's job is to chew on a treat to make it look like he is talking to Ryusei. And then to watch anime. Ah, I have no idea what the thought process was for this, but it was not a smart one. The whole concept just doesn't work well, especially with a Doberman. There are times you can clearly see him grabbing a treat when he is attacking a bad guy. <laughs> Also, for being a Doberman, he's pretty laid back. They should have made him a more aggressive assistant to Ryusei, but whatever. Either way, I am not a fan of Springer. Then again, I could say the same about Ryusei's other companions, my Ogi and Hakokita. Mai is a magazine photographer who is always looking for a new scoop and she becomes Ryusei's first friend. She has to teach him what it means to be human and how to interact with the world despite him being quite emotionless throughout. Hiroka Ota portrays Mai and does a pretty lousy job at being his female companion, considering the evolution the lead female has had over the last four years with Lily, Annie, Henri, and Diana. Mai makes Mimi from Gavin look completely useful. Mai can't even fight, which is a shame because Ryusei is such a boring protagonist. I know I had my qualms about Shider and Jiraiya, but Ryusei takes the cake when it comes to a one-dimensional, boring as all freaking hell main character. Now granted, it makes sense why Ryusei would be a total bore as he is supposed to be a robot, and therefore actor Akira Seno is playing the character the way he is written. The problem is he isn't all that thrilling to watch on screen and really needed a solid supporting cast to make up for his shortcomings. Instead, we get Mai and Changeman's Kazuoki Takahashi as Hako. Speaking of whom, Hako is a motorcycle racer who instantly falls in love with Mai upon meeting her when she is doing a story on him and becomes a steep of the show. He will often try to assist Metalder in the fights against Neros, which ends in some sort of silly failing antic. It's quite sad. It turns out that Hako used to lead a biker game before becoming a racer. Thankfully, the man is a really good guy who always tries his best no matter what. It's just that he doesn't do anything interesting to stand out. <laughs> I mean, 
I guess having Kenji Oba as a friend is about as interesting as he gets. <laughs> It's kind of funny because Princess Tenko also appears in this series, like she did in Denjimon and Gavin, which also featured Oba. Anyway, back to Ryusei, getting him really angry is what makes him transform into Metalder. So wait, he's the Incredible Hulk? As Metalder, he fights good old melee style without a single weapon. I do have to give Metalder credit, he will even disarm himself to beat an enemy. His suit is silver and blue on one side, while the other half is red and silver. I don't know why, but I also felt this was the most American looking toku suit ever. It's split the way it is as it's based off Kakaider's look. I don't think it's as striking as the previous Metal Hero suits, but at the same time, I do like that it is something completely different from what was being done, especially as the Jaspion and Spielbahn suits look very similar to each other. What's equally interesting is that Seno does not voice his Metaller form. Rather, that honor goes to Michiro Ida. <laughs> Ida previously voiced Dark Knight and Dynamon while also playing Hunter Killer in Gavin. Ryusei drives around in a car that can also fly. I stress the fact that it can also fly because there are many times when he is driving it and he should put it into flying mode but does not. There is an episode where a guy is being hunted down by the nearest empire and needs to visit his sick mother in the countryside. If only you had a flying car or something. Every step of the way, as it were, seems to be a struggle as they are constantly being attacked by Neros. Hmm. If only you had a flying car. This leads to Hako being injured. <laughs> If only you had a flying car. There's also a motorcycle with a sidecar that he will sometimes utilize, which can also fly. <laughs> I really hate you, Matelder. Let's move on to the villains. The Nero's Empire is filled with a bunch of overworked, underappreciated employees. Damn, are they run by Amazon? Their boss is none other than a World War II criminal who calls himself God Nero's. <laughs> God Neros was a scientist tried and found guilty for experimenting on prisoners of war, turning them into mutants. He faked his death and changed his identity to that of renowned philanthropist and CEO Gozo Kirahara. Kyu 
Hirahara then secretly grew his empire using the wealth he stole from various victims over the decades. Like with Metalder and Ryusei, we have two different actors playing our lead villain. As Spider-Man himself, Shinji Toto is Kirihara, while God Neros is voiced by Takeshi Watabe, who had been the second voice of Don Horror in Gavin, along with being Emperor Anton in Dynamin and La Gorn in Turbo Ranger. <laughs> Nero's plots to take over the world through economics, such as destroying oil reserves to drive the prices of oil up, create wars to crash the stock market, and sell weapons to terrorists on the black market. There are no lengths Neros will not resort to to get what he wants. Hmm, are we sure Neros is not currently disrupting our world? What if he is actually Donald Trump? <gasps> eh, no. That's highly unlikely because Neros is actually intelligent. Evil will always triumph because good is dumb. Even as secretaries, K and S are involved in his criminal activities. These two, played by Yuko Mitsui and Emeko Yamamoto, keep their boss in the loop on current affairs. They will often be the ones to spy on Ryusei or act as Neros' voice to those who are working for him. Neros様申し訳ありません。死の証人はデスタへ they rarely partake in battle, but when they do, they don't accomplish much. In fact, they're pretty useless other than to have girls the viewers can gawk at. When he isn't situated at the top of his corporate skyscraper, Neros will be sitting in his throne miles below the surface in a mobile fortress called the Ghost Bank. It is here that his minions reside, all of whom are broken up across four different armies with way too many different rankings to keep track of. Let's just say that each army is broken down between the top dog, his second in command, and then a bunch of lackeys that are lower than other lackeys. <laughs> The first army is the Armor Division, which are soldiers dressed in suits of armor. Their leader is a great swordsman known as Kulgin, who also seems to be Neros' favorite. This dude is so threatening that he is scared of the police. <laughs> Kugan is also the most loyal of Neros' soldiers for reasons that are unveiled at the tail end of the show. I rather like the concept between these warriors and they tended to be some of the most interesting characters with few exceptions. Kugan is voiced by Atsuo Mori, who I failed to mention was the voice of Baron Owl in my Jiraiya review, while also voicing various monsters in Sentai along with Chakram in Kamen Rider Black RX. <laughs> Two soldiers in the ranks, named Tagski and Tagsron, are brothers who aren't actually brothers but act closely like brothers. Oh. I get it. Takaku, you clever boy. The Tag Brothers are an interesting pair and their badass designs help. The 
next army is the Monster Army. These are mutants Nero's genetically engineered to do his bidding. They are slimy creatures who have no qualms about screwing others over to make themselves look good. They are led by Geldling, who has a glass dome over his head a la Mr. Freeze. <laughs> Geldling tends to always make excuses for why his minions lose, but has no qualms about taking credit for any successes his army may accomplish. As with the most in Jiraiya, actor Aisuke Yoda portrays Geldling. The most interesting member of the Monster Army is a weak little creature named Hedegross, as all he wanted to do was raise a family. His demise initially set his girlfriend up for a quest of vengeance against Metalder before learning she was pregnant. Later, her son appears with the same motivations despite it going against his mother's wishes. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense. It was a fascinating tale of woe and is the only time the Monster Army really shined. After the Monster Army comes the Armed Tank Army, which are a bunch of robots outfitted in heavy armor that allows them to take a beating in battle. Some wear armor resembling a plane or helicopters that allow them to fly. <laughs> Others dress like walking tanks so they can fire off a barrage of missiles in the midst of battle. Yeah! Jozo Izuka continues his role in the Metal Heroes franchise with the armed tank division's leader, Drangar. <laughs> Drangar is the most forgettable of the four leaders, which shouldn't come to a surprise because I had a hard time distinguishing what the difference was between the armed tank army and the final army, the battle robots. Both are robots, so why are there two different groups? It's because the battle robots are actually cyborgs created using the same technology Dr. Koga used to create Metalder. Oh! If you say so. Balski is the leader of the Battle Robot Army, who often shows compassion towards his minions as long as it does not result in treachery. He also tends to take responsibility for any misfortune they may endure. Balski is interestingly complex for being a machine man, which makes up for the bland forgettableness that was Drangar. Takeshi Kuwabara lends his voice to Balski, who would go on to be the narrator of Soul Brain and Jam Person, along with Live Man for Sentai. As with the Armored Army, I do like this group and find them far more interesting than the Monster and Armed Tank ones. It also helps that the best character in the show is part of the Battle Robot Army, and that is a sniper warrior based on the manga assassin Gogol 13 named Top Gunder. <laughs> Top Gunder begins the show wanting to have a one-on-one -on -one battle with Metalder, only for those dreams to be dashed away by the Monster Army's selfishness. His retaliation against the Monster Army causes him to be sentenced to execution for disobedience. He becomes an ally of Metalder's, though his code of honor will not allow him to reveal his creator's location to Metalder. <laughs> This adds both a layer of complexity and foolishness towards Top Gunder. On one hand, the threat of Neros could have ended right then and there, sparing all of his future victims. Alternatively, his valiant nature might have stemmed from knowing Metalder was not strong enough yet to defeat Neros, and revealing his location would have meant certain doom. He frequently appears to help Metalder in times of need and eventually partakes in the final showdown with his former overlord. Atsumori also provides the voice of Top Gunder. <laughs> Hmm? 
the armies will often battle each other gladiator style to determine who is going to be the one to go after Metallica first. <laughs> They also love to party as often as possible. And host their own Olympic like sporting events just because they can. I really like the aspect that 90% of the villains Mattel are we're going to face off against appeared right from the start, as it sets the show apart from everything else. The only thing I'm not a fan with these guys is how some of them will die in battle in one episode, then be back episodes later as if nothing ever happened. It makes sense with the robots and mutants, but not those from the armored army. I do also find it amusing that the armies will drive in vehicles that make me think they stepped out of a Mad Max film. The effects and music. The effects and music for Metallica are on par with what was coming out at the time. I have to give a lot of credit to the production crew behind the Ghost Bank. It is very atmospheric and quite a complex set. Then again, given they had created 40 monster costumes right off the bat, this entire show was complicated. They had to constantly repair those suits time and time again as they were always breaking over the span of filming. Seno has said the amount of flashing lights and sparks used on the Ghost Bank set made him go blind for a bit, causing production to be halted for three days. As as such, there is no denying a lot of care was put into the show. There are some top-notch fight sequences too. I really like the battles between Metalda and the Tag Brothers. Well, not as impressive as the camera work found in its predecessors, Metaller does have some really well shot moments. The biggest achievement I must give to the team was the Jack Pierce-like transformation sequence they used whenever Kirahara would transform into God Neros. It is terrifically terrifying. Metalder was composed by Seiji Yokoyama, who would go on to score the likes of O Ranger and Wind Spectre on top of having done the anime series Dairugar 15, Captain Harlock, and Saint Seiya. It makes sense as I totally got an O Ranger vibe when it came to the tones found here. It's a very moody set of music to help supplement the tragedy that is unfolding on screen. Asao Sasaki's opening song, Kimi no Seishun wa Kagayaita Iruka, is an enjoyable 80s synth tune mixed with some classical pieces. <laughs> It's a fairly solid opening, though I prefer the first half of the song over the second. <laughs> the 
The ending theme is the opposite, as Time Limit is not bad, specifically in its second half. Time Limit was sung by the recently passed Ichiro Mizuki, with Kurugi73 on backup vocals. The Episodes. Matilda is... interesting. It is a show all about the villains. Like, there is a major heavy focus on the villains, so much so that sometimes the first third of an episode will be done before it shifts its focus on Ryosei and his friends. It's definitely one of the most interesting aspects of the show. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but that also made the show rather dull and boring at times. The villains take up so much screen time it doesn't really allow Ryusei to be developed very much. Equally troubling is while the number of villains was impressive from a production standpoint, it makes it hard to keep track of them. There are just way too many personalities on screen at one time to the point where many of them blend together. I can tell you plots that occurred, but if you asked me to identify which villains took part in that plot, I would look at you in a haze. I can completely see why the series did not appeal to children in the slightest. Worse, due to the poor ratings, they changed the time slot and tried to make the show more kid friendly, which alienated the adults that were enjoying it. We went from plots about trying to take over the world using economics to the adventures of pet sitting. <laughs> It made the tone jarring at times, and then the series was initially cancelled, with episode 37 planned to be the finale. This meant the armor of every villain was suddenly as strong as tissue paper, causing a non-stop onslaught of the villains dying by the dozen. Of course, Toei ended up extending the show by another two episodes as they were having production issues with Jiraiya, which may have revolved around the departure of that show's original head writer leaving after the first episode. Whatever the case may be, Takaku was hired on to take over the writing of Jiraiya, and as such was unable to tackle the final pair of episodes. Toei sought secondary writer Kunio Fuji to finish the show, resulting in a messy finale with a lot of lingering questions that remained unanswered. Fuji had apparently asked Takaku to not kill off a certain character in episode 37, so he could have that character's story continue in the next episode and write a final plot around the new event. My favorite episode of the series is episode 11, The Hero's Pursuit, The Legend Soars Into the Sky. This is a really intriguing episode because we never actually see Ryusei, just Metalda. The episode starts with a quick battle between Metalda and a robot, which then leads to this robot being repaired by an old soldier named Big Wayne. Party on, Wayne. The episode then focuses on Big Wayne wanting to retire from battle and leave Neros' empire. <laughs> Gochak, one of the members of the Battle Robot Army, who highly respects Big Wayne, tries to help him escape, only for it to be a fruitless task. We're now 15 minutes in the episode, and this is the first time since the 217 mark that we actually get Metalder on screen. I was pretty impressed with how little to no presence the show's only hero had in this episode, and I'm not sure if it was an ambitious endeavor or a foolish one. Either way, the entire story revolving around Big Wayne was very engaging as you really felt sorry for this dude. It was also nice not to have to see Ryusei's emotionless face for a change. <sighs> yeah, I get the irony here. I was just complaining about how Ryusei barely got screen time throughout episodes. And now my favorite episode is one where he's not even featured in. I understand. It's kind of confusing to explain. It's just this episode was a damn good episode. 
I just wish the entire series had actually developed Ryusei better. Now we come to my least favorite episode, which is hard to decide because there were a lot of mediocre ones. There was the two-parter that featured the bits I referenced earlier in the review with Ryusei not using his flying car when necessary. Then there was one with a jackass father who ties their dog to a tree and drives off, drops his daughter off at a riverbed, so then he can go and abandon a box of puppies. I'm not really a big pet person, but you, sir, are an asshole. Shit! Even one of the villains cannot believe someone would just leave a bunch of puppies lying around to die. You know you're in the wrong when even the freaking dudes trying to conquer the world are mad at you. Like, goddamn, this dude is the worst villain of the entire series. And yet, this still isn't even my least favorite episode. That honor goes to the one titled, The Flying Roller Skaters, The Red Dolphins Attack. In this story, Ryusei sees a girl standing about and is suddenly attacked by a gang of roller skaters in jerseys and hockey masks, calling themselves the Red Dolphins. <laughs> It turns out they are working for Nero's because Nero's has employed children to do his dirty work. And that's all this episode really is. It's a bunch of scenes of the Red Dolphins attacking Ryusei and his friends because that's what they were told to do. They even spike Mai's ice cream at one point. <laughs> They eventually find out who they are working for and rebel. It might not get you screaming at the TV like the dipshit father episode, but it was still a really dumb, boring episode that easily stole the show for being the worst. The movie! Metalder is the first series since Scheider to have a theatrical film. It's set between episodes 17 and 18 and pretty much plays out like a normal episode. Neros is sick and tells his minions that whoever defeats Metalder can take over the Empire if he does not survive. We don't know how sick he is, what his ailment is, or if he actually is sick and just didn't want to stay home from work that day. Whatever the case may be, we see which of his armies actually cherishes him before proceeding forward with trying to take out Metalder. <laughs> Now what's really weird is the Tag Brothers seem to be killed in this movie by Metalder, but then show up in subsequent episodes. <laughs> Metalder is a very frustrating show. There are a lot of great ideas bogged down by poor execution. Ryusei is a boring protagonist and doesn't have a strong supporting cast to make up for it. As such, I have no choice but to give Chojinki Matelder a 2 out of 5 grown-ups in spandex. It may be dark, and it may have put a lot of emphasis on its villains, but it doesn't mean much when it is a chore to sit through. I don't hate Metalder, I just wish it had lived up to its potential. The ending also left a very bitter taste in my mouth. Until next time, bye!
dirty rat! You killed my brother!